Hello, and welcome to episode three of the I Know That Feel podcast. I'm your host, DJ Whitepill, and today I'm joined by Lynn Din, who's a writer for the UnsReview.com, and he gives uh, an introduction of himself in, in just a moment. I'll play that, our, our interaction. But first, I just wanted to say, I think he's uh, he's pretty humble, so he doesn't do justice. He, he, he has traveled all over the world and and a lot and so you should check the show notes i'll put all the links to to all of his his previous work and all the places he's traveled he's got some good photography you can check it out uh the other thing i wanted to say is that a lot of the questions i ask there's no easy answer you know you're not going to get just a simple i mean as he'll say in the interview it's not a just black and white kind of thing uh, i guess no pun intended you can't just say okay these are the good guys these are the bad guys da, da, da. one one of the big themes i wanted to focus on is loyalty because uh, I myself, you know, basically my soul is Russian, my blood is German, and my my culture, my my social aspect is American. So it's very tough, you know. And I think as the world globalizes, more and more people will relate. And so that's why I wanted to ask him. And uh, you know, I I think it's yeah, it's tough. There's no easy answer. So I kept asking, you know, where where do you feel more at home? And and it, it wasn't I feel more at home in Vietnam. And you know, he's a uh, it's a well-traveled man, so he's got a complex soul, complex mindset, and um, I think it's pretty interesting. So I hope you guys enjoy. But before I play the interview, uh, I wanted to put in some music, and I think this is pretty fitting. Uh, these, this is a band that's pretty good, and this is some music from around, I think it's 2006, 2008. I'll, I'll look it up later, put it in the show notes. But this is a band called Defiance Ohio, and there's two songs I was listening to recently that I thought, man, this, this is kind of the white pill of the the horseshoe theory and the horseshoe theory is is it maybe it's bullshit but the horseshoe theory is that if you go far enough left uh, on the the political spectrum i mean if you're going to put it on a, a linear line most people say that's stupid and that's not how politics works most people are nuanced but okay if you're going to put it on a linear scale it bends and curves around so the people on the far left are like the people on the far right and i think you see this when people both left and right in America, try to pin Nazis. They say, "No, oh, he's socialist. Socialist is the name." They say, "No, he's 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 right wing because he's racist." And da, da, da. so, <clears throat> with this, I do think there's some truth to it. And I think if you go far enough, if you keep getting red pilled, if you keep getting um, you know go down the rabbit hole far enough, you'll start to realize that you actually have a lot in common with your your leftist buddies. You know, a lot of my leftist friends at first, it was God, it was tense. And then the further I went, the more I had in common. And so, Lynn, he actually started. He, he doesn't like this and he's, he never was on the left, but I think to an outsider, if we wanted to oversimplify it, I think he was more uh, left-leaning, or at least his compatriots were, and he slowly kind of shifted to the right. And so a lot of the stuff he says, even in his old, old writings, you'll probably relate to. And same with this music. And I think later on, I'll play some new protest songs that were people from the right. So the, the, these songs now uh, are about Bush's Iraq war and the songs I'll play in the middle of the podcast. Uh, are actually people who are Nazis <laughs> who are protesting the Syrian war and Hillary Clinton. So it's a, uh, I think it, things have gone full circle. Oh, and also this music I think is very fitting because a lot of the stuff that he he specializes in when he's traveling around America is is seeing the real nitty gritty, true American downtrodden hick kind of aspects of America as well as the ghetto. So this kind of um, folk vibe i think is very fitting for him and his career so hope you guys enjoy and without further ado here we go we are sheep in wolf's clothing we got big important friends who with a twinkle in their eyes say they'll be with you till the end they invite you out for ice cream they insist you eat your fill then they smile at each other and they stick you with the bill they giggle extra hard when you max out your credit card we are sheep in Clothing you're watched over by your friends. They hook you up with an apartment in a big barbed wire pen. And they come and pinch your cheeks with such fatherly affection. And they tap into your emails solely for your own protection. They counted votes from the black sheep, but they still win their elections. And you live a life of privilege in the shadow of your friends who secure the greenest pastures with their business acumen. So you graze on the ground. Shred a safety with a shirt right off your back, and you're. 
sacrifice reveals you patriotic sons and daughters were once sheep and wolves clothing now your lambs of the slaughter they say the new world order is just god's master plan but if the blueprint calls for some to starve well don't blame god's right hand man because the president is holy and the president is pious and hallelujah he's good old boy Before we get into anything, I think your views, um, you know, from me stalking you all over the internet and in the various places you've written um, and your books and everything, it seems your views have changed in, in recent years and you've also been mischaracterized a lot and your Wikipedia seems like just straight up slander. So before we, we get into the, the nuance, do you mind just um, telling a little bit, you know, an intro about yourself and, and kind of clearing any, any BS out there about yourself? Uh, sure. Um... I'm 55 years old. Uh, I was born in uh, Vietnam, and uh, I came to the United States when I was 11. And I went to uh, art school. I, I wanted to be a painter. Uh, that didn't work out because I, I, I just didn't like college very much. So I dropped out of, 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 of art school, and uh, I started to, um, to write. And I pretty much just taught myself. I, I, you know, I just believe that if you want to be an artist or a writer, you should just um, just... Just go at it, you know. Um, you shouldn't pay anyone to teach you anything. So uh, I was a house painter in Philadelphia for, uh, I guess, a decade or so. I was a house cleaner. You know, I did a lot of really crappy jobs, you know, like a lot of, lot of other people. No big deal. But anyway, um, and then I started to publish. And I got a couple of breaks. I, I got a, a, a Pew Grant that paid me $50,000 over two years. That, that was a kind of a life changer. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I got a few other, well, a couple other awards. Uh, anyway, so I started to publish. So I started to teach a little bit because colleges would invite me to um, to teach. And uh, some of them would just, you know, uh, many of them would just bring me in to, to give a talk, a reading. And um, so for a while, things were going sort of OK. I mean, I, I never live well or anything. I mean, I live very minimally. But, um, you know, I got by. But um, uh, I didn't fit very well in, uh, in the, the academy. Uh, so wherever I taught, um, you know, I, I tend to stay away from the other uh, instructors. Um, you know, I was never comfortable with, uh, within the university uh, framework. So, so right there, th there's a problem because most uh, American writers uh, gravitate towards the, the university because that's where they can get uh, job security. And uh, but th there is a big problem there because um, they pretty much um, brainwashing centers. <laughs> you know, they, they're not there to uh, to foster a difference uh, of opinions, but to um, to pretty much tell you what to think. You know, so that there, uh, th there is very little intellectual freedom in uh, in within any American university, which is very paradoxical because you think that's where you you will you go to get to learn how to think independently, but that's not what happens at all. So anyway, um, I was a very bad fit in within the American universities, and um, but I still managed to get by, and uh, I started to write politically. 
Okay, so because I, I just I just thought it was very limiting that so many poets or, or American writers in general are not uh, talking to any um, sort of a general audience. They pretty much just uh, talking to each other and trying to impress each other. So um, I thought that a writer's job is to, um, you know, to have a voice in society. So I started to write politically. And uh, part of that was influenced by my time in Vietnam because I, I, I returned to Vietnam a few times and uh, uh, in 1999, I came back here and I stayed for two and a half years. And I realized that um, many Vietnamese writers um, were, were uh, risking quite a bit to have a public voice, you know, um, political harassment, some of them were jailed. So I thought, wow, this, you know, this is how serious this writing activity uh, actually is. So, I mean, I translated some of these writers. I got to know some of these writers. So I came back to the United States with a different uh, mindset about what a writer should do. And uh, so when I start to write politically, I publish in these, uh, at these webzines, uh, you know, uh, like Common Dreams and Counterpunch. Uh, they were generally on the left, okay? But then uh, after a while, they pretty much told me to go away. Like Common Dreams, when they were when uh, Obama was about to be reelected, or they were trying to reelect Obama, they stopped publishing me, period. Although I had a pretty good audience there. I mean, I had a fairly, uh, I was fairly popular on Common Dreams. And I, I thought, we, we, but, but because I wasn't a supporter of the Democratic Party, of Obama. I, I didn't vote for Obama the first time. Okay. So anyway, um, uh, yeah, it was, you know, so basically they didn't have uh, any room for me because I was, uh, I was a free thinker. So anyway, and uh, at, at Counterpunch, when I start to write my postcard series, which are, are pieces about specific towns or specific neighborhoods, and pretty much featuring um, common people, regular people, people I already knew. It wasn't no, any big deal for me to, to, to talk to these people. But anyway, I would get on a bus, a Greyhound or Amtrak, go somewhere and meet people and talk to them and, and profile these places. And Counterpunch just told me they didn't want these postcards. So I thought it was very funny, you know, that the, uh, in theory, they all for um, the working man, you know, the masses, but, uh, when you actually quote these regular people, the ordinary people, uh, basically these left ve venues didn't want to hear from them. So I thought that was very instructive and telling. So I, I never categorized myself as either left or right. You know, I just thought, uh, just speak the truth. Just say whatever you think is true, like really think is true and not try to uh, tailor your message to fit in anywhere. So I, 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 I still don't categorize myself as either left or right. So anyway, um, so I was out from Common Dreams and then Counterpunch didn't want me. Uh, they did say they would accept my articles, you know, general uh, political uh, polemics, but not the postcard series. But that, that became my uh, main activity. So, um, so I, you know, I had no, uh, no slot at Counterpunch either. And, you know, I mean, the, the editors kind of got nasty when uh, readers start to complain about my absence at Counterpunch. And he, he got pretty nasty and pretty um, insulting towards me too. But, you know, th that's something else altogether. But anyway, so, um, you know, after a while, there was really not many places where I could publish. And then um, I started to publish at Unz Review and uh, Ron Unz started to pay me. You know, first time I ever got paid to write these uh, political uh, articles. Uh, readers would send me money through PayPal. So uh, some of them were very generous, you know. Uh, so basically for like six or seven years, I was more or less supported um, mostly by, by readers through, through PayPal. So, but Ron Unz uh, would pay me, you know, a few thousand dollars a year. And it was, you know, it's not that big. It's not that much. You, you, you can't really live on that, but it was something. So anyway, um, I don't think my opinions, my my uh, my views have changed that much, except for in one critical area. Uh, um, I start to talk about Jewish power more directly because I start to learn about it uh, more. 
Okay, so uh, you know people would talk about Zionism, uh, Zionism, and you know Israel, but they would not talk about Jewish power. And I don't see why you should avoid that term because you can talk about uh, uh, black power or Chinese power or Russian power. You know, like any group has has his uh, leverage. And Jews also obviously have have power, so you can talk about Jewish power, you know. But but people are very uh, touchy about that, so you can't say Jewish power. You can you know uh, you you can't even criticize Jews for anything. You can criticize uh, white people for plenty of things now. That seems to be the fashion these days. You can mm -hmm. say the Russians do this or the Chinese do that, but you can't say the Jews do anything. So, so there's that uh, there's that uh, Voltaire quote that that is kind of become cliche now, but they say. Uh, to find out who rules over you, um, see who you can't criticize. Sure. And then I saw I saw an an adaptation of that where it's like it shows you know kids with leukemia. <laughs> <It was> yeah. like, <laughs> so, but yeah, I, I think that is definitely true. That I think it's a definite red flag. You know, why why can't you deny the Holocaust? You can deny a lot of things. You can't deny the Holocaust. You can't talk about this. And I think um, for a lot of people, it's a blind spot. Like I thought. I mean, that's kind of the funny thing is that. Uh, I mean, I, I agree with you. They they champion themselves as free thinkers, but a lot of times the the people in universities are the exact opposite. But they don't they don't realize it because they're in such a bubble. Um, there's a quote that I'm thinking of. It's I think it's Michael Parenti. He says, "Are you telling me that I'm not my own man? I'll have you know that in 17 years with this paper, I always say what I like, and I say to them, you say what you like because they like what you say, and you have no sensation." of a restraint on your freedom. I mean, you don't know you're wearing a leash if you sit by the peg all day. Yeah, uh, I think that's definitely true. And for me, opening my eyes was actually going to Vietnam. And um, because you guys don't have the brainwashing there. And no. so people would talk about, I would ask my students, I, I used to teach there, and I'd ask the students, just, you know, stupid, um, you know, substitute teacher kind of uh, assignment. I said, okay, give me 10 people that you respect in history. And a lot of them, of course, they, pretty much everybody said Ho Chi Minh and all this stuff. And there was a couple that, hit, that did Hitler, and I, you know, I was just in shock. And I wasn't a leftist by any means or offended, but I just like I couldn't comprehend it because that was my my blinders. I was so you know, and and they were just so objective about it. They're like, I was like, yeah, but he like killed people, and it, you know, and I was just trying to understand. I was like, you you understand who this is, right? And I thought, you know, I and yeah, again, it's kind of stupid of me, but I thought, okay, maybe the swastika because I saw people with Hitler shirts and Mein Kampf translated in Thailand and stuff, and I thought, oh, maybe it's the the Buddhist symbol or like they maybe they don't understand. They need to be educated, you know, this this kind of bullshit um, patronizing view, you know, looking back on it. And and then the more I looked into it, and I remember teaching in them, it was way out there. I think it was like District Twelve in in Saigon or you know, kind of out out in the boondocks. And I saw kids carve a swastika and, and I thought, oh, you know, it's just swastika. And I looked close and they said Third Reich in English. And I thought, OK, this is not a coincidence. There's a genuine. And I think that's that's a that's an exception. I think most Vietnamese just don't care. And um, yeah. most of Asia's just it, again, it's just a part of history, just like Napoleon. Like no, no one in America cares about Napoleon. It's the same thing. So these experiences, I don't want to give the, uh, the, the notion that everyone's, you know, neo-Nazi movement. No, it's 0.001 percent, but they just they don't care. And yeah. that allowed me to kind of question things and, and open my eyes. So I guess one question for you is, um, and, and one thing I ask everybody is, was there anything, I mean, usually it's just over time thinking about things, but can you think of anything cataclysmic or was it just being exposed to maybe like Uns and, and that group of people? No, no, was it wasn't. It wasn't Uns. It wasn't, I, I tell you, I mean, yeah, they're, they're, uh, I, I used to teach at, at Bard, Bard College in upstate New York. And the president was a, a dual citizen, a citizen of Israel and the United States. I can't remember his name at the moment. But anyway, uh, there was a professor who wrote a book critical of Israel at Bard College, and he was fired. So he was trying to um, get some attention to, you know, to, you know, that he he claimed that because of his book that he got, you know, that they got rid of him. Uh, you know, it was basically uh, the president, the Israeli president versus the Jewish professor who wrote a book critical of Israel. So anyway, I was, um, you know, I was teaching there only in, in the summer. I didn't have a contract or anything. They would just bring me in and then, you know, next summer ask me to come back. So um, there was a forum for the board community, uh, the MFA community. And um, so I brought up this is issue, you know, like this professor, got, you know, got bumped from Bard because of this book. Is that true? And no one would discuss uh, this case with me. And they were talking about everything else, you know, very, 
uh, very willingly, you know, I mean, they, they, they would chatter on about all kinds of subjects. And I thought, wow, this is very bizarre. You know, they didn't dare to to raise their voice uh, in support of this professor or even discuss this case. So I thought, wow, they, they are that fearful of the president. Right. So uh, I thought, wow, you know, these so these people are, are cowards, basically, my, my colleagues. Right. So so that, that was one red flag. And then um, I um, one of my blog readers. Uh, invited me to um, come to Michigan to meet uh, Henry uh, Herskovitz. Uh, Rudy List, uh, uh, you know, invited me to come to Michigan to meet Henry uh, Herskovitz. He, you know, um, uh, Henry was an engineer in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And after he retired, uh, he went to Israel for the first time. And what he saw was so appalling as far as the treatment of Palestinians that when he came back to Ann Arbor, he asked, his synagogue, if he could just talk to, to the congregation. This is the congregation that he has attended for decades. He thought these were his friends and, you know, his, his family, kind of, sort of. So anyway, um, the rabbi refused to allow him to talk to the, you know, um, to, about what he saw with his own eyes uh, in Israel uh, to, to, to his fellow um, Jews in, in, this, in the synagogue. So Henry got so upset that he, he stopped going to the synagogue and he has been holding um, a protest every Saturday, uh, I think for maybe 13 years now, something, I mean, something ridiculous. I mean, every, every Saturday he's there, okay? So I met Henry and talked to him about uh, all kinds of issues and I, I realized, wow, you know, there's a lot to think about here. And Henry brought up the Holocaust because Time Magazine had just published a special issue on Hitler, you know, because at this time they were trying to uh, brand uh, Putin as a new Hitler, you know, so anyway, there's a, somehow, there, all of a sudden, there's a special issue on Hitler. And Henry said, you know, you, he, he lent me the, the, the special issue, and he, he said, you, you know, it's only like 90 pages or something, you know, just, just skim through it and see if you can, you know, notice that they don't mention uh, the gas chamber. They barely mention the Holocaust in this, this 90 pages of, of, you know, profile Hitler. So that's already a little strange. And when they did mention the, the Holocaust, they did not talk about a gas chamber, which is supposed to be how Jews were killed. So then they say, wait a second, are they, are they backing off from that claim? You, you see what I'm saying? So, so that, that, that was another red flag. So, and then, um, so I started to read more about it myself, you know, and from what I've read, uh, there is really no physical evidence, first off, of uh, gas chambers being able to exterminate uh, that many Jews. I mean, it just didn't happen that way, at least. Okay. So, and uh, the six million figure has also been uh, revised downward by millions. Okay. Even in uh, official uh, uh, histories, uh, history books. So you, you, know, you can't just throw figures like that around, you know, like you can't say, oh, it was six and it was four and a half. It was three. You can't say stuff like that, you know, and, uh, well, uh, they, they can and they camps. do though. <laughs> right. I mean, you, you can't say stuff like that. But anyway, and, and plus, how do you how do you get rid of all those bodies? Where are the bodies? Where are the bones? I mean, there are really there are literally no physical evidence of that kind of ex extermination program. Now, no, I'm not saying that Jews are not mistreated, you know, and they, I'm not saying no Jews die. But, you know, as far as the final solution, uh, there is literally no evidence for it. OK, so and, and another uh, another um, factor in my thinking was that I, I was invited to teach in Leipzig, Germany. So I was there for five months. And when I was there, I realized that the Germans, my students anyway, they really hated being German. <laughs> you know? I, really, I realized how damaging it was, this Holocaust guilt, okay? And it wasn't my first time in Germany because I, on a previous occasion, I visited Berlin when I saw the Holocaust Memorial. And it's the ugliest thing ever. I'm not, I mean, just on the aesthetic level. It's just... <laughs> Huge mess in the middle of Berlin, you know, it's like this constant reminder that, you know, Germans are evil. And I'm saying, I'm, OK, so so when I talk to my students, they pretty much all hated being German. And I realized, wait a second, this is very damaging and this is ongoing. And, um, you know, it affects how they think. It affects German public policies, German uh, self-awareness, uh, self-perception, you know, uh, it, it, and, and the Holocaust is used to... Um, give Israel a free ride. I mean, they can do anything. And Jewish power, a free ride, you know, so that they can um, cause all kinds of um, chaos and uh, and genocide. I mean, they are responsible for genocide right now. You know, I mean, look at how many people they're killing. 
uh, how many uh, Muslim countries they, they have destroyed already? You know, and uh, okay, an, an, another factor was when I visited Istanbul and I saw the Syrians, you know, uh, refugees on the street of, uh, streets of Istanbul begging uh, infants. To, I mean, they, just, they were just pathetic, you know. And so, uh, you know, uh, you, the United States is being used by the Jews to destroy these countries that the Jews hate, okay? And then these refugees are being pushed into these countries. Uh, and if, uh, let's say, Poland resists accepting Syrian refugees, they call racists. You know, but a country should have a right to decide who to let in. And I'm very sympathetic towards the Syrians. I'm very sympathetic towards the uh, Muslims because I, uh, I, I did a lot of work almost for free for uh, uh, press TV, the Iranian uh, TV station. You know, I would provide political commentary for them for um, very minimal pay. Okay, I mean, it was basically a labor of love. So uh, audio uh, commentaries and sometimes at, in the studio. So I, anyway, uh, I'm very sorry. sympathetic towards, uh, you know, uh, the plight of Muslims who have been destroyed by the United States in conjunction with Israel. But that doesn't mean that these refugees have a right to move into Europe. I mean, the, 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 the solution is to not destroy their countries. OK, and I was trying to tell my German students that, you know, if you want to support the refugees, tell your government not to support the United States in destroying these Muslim countries. OK, how come no one's talking about this, these serial, uh, uh, all these wars against Muslim countries, uh, you know, this, this ongoing systematic destruction of Muslim societies? How come, how come you all, all you're talking about is accepting refugees? You know, the, but the, the, the real solution is to not make them refugees in the first place. I mean, that seems pretty obvious, but the German kids couldn't quite see that. Mm. Because they're so brainwashed that the end, no matter what, the 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 conclusion, whatever the formula is, it's got to equal fuck white people. It's got to equal Germans <laughs> are are the victims. You know that's kind of, yeah, it's 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 depressing, man. Um, real quick for for listeners who haven't um checked out your work before, uh, it he does a lot of photography, and uh, you you. Again, this is a big theme of the podcast that it, as you've already showed, you've traveled all over. And that's one of the most red pilling experiences is seeing how different cultures work and, and seeing people on a on a day to day basis. And it was Jews themselves who red pilled you on the Holocaust and, and this whole narrative. So I think that kind of blows the the notion that, oh, you're just a bigot. You're just in a small town. It's, it's the exact opposite, especially in your case. Um, one of the things I wanted to uh, say real quick as well is that I think. One of the things um, that, that people may have if they're on the right is they're kind of, you know, very nationalist, very patriotic. And so you can be resistant to these these to this truth about how Israel is basically using us as the strong arm for things that don't benefit us at all. And in fact, make the rest of the world hate us, that, that drive up our debt, that is that is only benefiting one country uh, and a few, you know, big corporations and stuff like that and you know, military industrial complex, yada, yada. Um, I think part of the reason that you can get defensive is because, you know, that's my country, it's America, da da da. But I, th I think when, when you start to realize the influence of the Israeli lobby and you kind of see it as, as them and not you and your, you know, you realize, ah, we're, we're, we're the stupid patsy, basically. We're, we're being used in this, that when you, when you start to read Lynn's um, articles, you, you know, you shouldn't take it personally because uh, some of yours are pretty, pretty anti-American. And the first guest I had is, is Brett. Um, and he is also pretty anti-American, but he's American himself. You you grew up, I think I when I stalked you on the internet, I saw that you moved to America when you were 12. And you still have love for these people, and you can see it if you if you read your interviews. And the other thing, just one one more thing I wanted to say on that is that looking at how you write about Vietnam, you do the same thing. I think you kind of have a, a desire to to explore the the gritty reality. So I've seen some of your photography in Vietnam. You're not trying to show the fanciest part. You you'll find, you know, I think I saw like a broken uh, dilapidated like doll on the street and you just want to see the reality wherever it is and you love Vietnam I don't know how you feel about America but again this is America the empire now that's collapsing and I think uh, that's that's something that's very disheartening and for me uh, I wanted to ask you about where and I don't mean this as a gotcha at all 
is is it something that I think a lot of people as the world globalizes and where you know travel becomes more easy and you know the internet connects us all I think a lot of people are kind of having a identity crisis especially white people because as you said earlier we're not allowed to have anything positive it's basically white people you know white power don't talk about that you can you know you can be proud Asian you can have Asian power da, da, da. but white people you're not allowed to have that so there's, there's this kind of bottled up tension going on and people go full Nazi they say you know what screw it you know, hail Hitler, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm white and I'm proud. Da, da, da. Um, but still, like for me, I'm American. You know, I was born there. My family goes generations back. We were one of the earlier pioneers. I should have loyalty to them, but it's not the same as Russians. Russians, I was just at the, 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 uh, basically it's the Cosmos, or the, the astronaut museum in Moscow. And with my girlfriend and she's Russian and she was looking at the old Soviet uniforms and she said, wow, I'm so proud of my country. But that's Soviet Union, right? That's not Russia. Well, of course, it's the same people and more or less the same, you know, similar borders. It's the same people with surrounded by a wall. That's your people. So Vietnam, I think you can have that same kind of bond. And so it's the blood and soil question. Where where does my loyalty lie? Does it lie in Germany? I've never been there. My ancestors there. But, um, you know, so for you, sorry for such a long intro, but I, I'm curious because you've been all over. You, you're moving back to Vietnam. I know you, you said partly it's because, you know, these people have kind of shunned you and academia is a, is a farce and that's a bunch of scam artists and, and dopes. So that's part of why you're in Vietnam, but it seems like you obviously have a, a loyalty there. So can you just kind of expand on that? Like where, where would you say your loyalties lie? Um, you said you're a regionalist. I mean, you don't have to say that, you know, you like Vietnam. Yeah. I, do you, do you, yeah. Anyways, I'll shut up. So you get the idea. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, identity but, and loyalty. Can you, can you just go off on that? But Michael, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not anti-American. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm anti-American foreign policies, you know, I, I'm, I'm anti the American empire, you know, uh, you know, not not the culture, uh, although there's certain aspects of the culture that I'm very critical of. But, uh, you know, uh, I spent most of my life in the United States and, you know, I'm an American writer because I, I continue to write in English and I'm most comfortable in English. And, you know, I've been uh, nourished by, um, you know, American and English language literature, you know, so uh, and I have a, a deep affection for Europe, you know, specifically. So, you know, it's not like I'm, you know, anti-white or anything, you know, I mean, far from it, you know, I, I'm, I defend nationalism as a, uh, as, as a natural uh, expression, uh, you know, as an organic um, expression of any community, any, any community should be nationalist, okay, uh, and, and I use that uh, in the term, not not loyal, not loyal to the state, but loyal to the nation. OK, and what is meant by the nation? Uh, the nation is first off the language. OK, because you can't even you can't even pin it down to ethnicity, although a lot of times that is also um, a strong factor. OK, so like in Vietnam, um, you know, there's 53 tribes here, uh, uh, ethnic groups here. Uh, most most people here identify as Vietnamese, but, you know, they, they mix, you know, um, I mean, my, my nephew is a quarter Chinese. I mean, I love him. You know, I mean, I, I hang out with him every day as, as when I'm in Saigon. So, you know, um, people have different strains here. But, you know, but the language holds everything together, uh, first off, and then the culture, you know, the history. So um, if you don't have the language, you don't have the culture, then what do you have? OK, so the United States used to have that. And it also had. Uh, a kind of idealism in the sense of uh, is uh, attachment to the Constitution, you know, like certain American concepts that originate in the United States. OK, but it, the Constitution is meaningless now. You know, no one talks about mm. defending freedom of speech or uh, so on. You know, what I'm saying like very basic rights are being ignored now. So so uh, if you remove that and you don't have an ethnic um, foundation and uh, and if you don't even uh, have a shared uh, veneration for the language and for the literature, then what do you have? So that's where the United States mm -hmm. is at today, is that it's so fragmented. Uh, people um, uh, are, actually, people are deeply racist, but, they, but the media, the mainstream media, allows certain groups to be racist without any um, consequences. And I'm talking about, you know, black people can be as racist as they, as they want, uh, Basically, non-whites can be as racist as they, as they want. But as soon as white talks about, you know, white heritage, then they, they condemn as Nazis. 
And I find that bizarre, you know, because everybody should be proud of their heritage, should be proud of history, and should be proud of their skin. I mean, what's wrong with that? I mean, you know, I don't see why that's an issue. I mean, Vietnamese are proud of who they are, you know. Uh, that doesn't mean that they are blind to their uh, uh, defects and, you know, um, the absurdities, or well, some of them don't see the absurdities, but still, they have an attachment to who they are and who, you know, because they love themselves and they love their families. That That's just common sense, right? I mean, so I, I've written about this, that, you know, so-called racism has um, as its foundation basically self-love, and people should be able to love themselves, right? And everybody does already. You can't, you know, you can't um, cure yourself of that, you know? But that doesn't mean that you have a right to violate anybody else. I never advocate that you should you know, uh, trample on anyone else's uh, rights or dignity just because you love yourself, okay? But um, so so nationalism is, is something I've always defended. And uh, uh, here's another, I've spent two years in Italy, okay? And in, I live in a, in a town that was 16,000 people and I obviously did not belong there. I mean, you know, my wife and I were obviously the outsiders, but I felt so grounded there because we would pull into the community. So that taught me too about the the, the importance of um, of um, of being loyal to where you are. Okay, so so um, you know because I I came to love Italy during my time there. I still love Italy. I do not want Italy to be um, corrupted or to be changed by anything, including say a huge influx of Vietnamese. I do not want Vietnamese to suddenly move to Chitado where I was. You know what I'm saying? I mean, okay, I was there. My wife was there. We were two Vietnamese. I did not want a thousand Vietnamese to move into Chetado because that would change Chetado, uh, you know, irreversibly. And, and I don't, you know, why should Chetado um, accept that unless they themselves want that? Okay, then whatever. You know, if people, hey, if we want, we want, you know, 6,000 Al Albanians or 6,000 uh, Kenyans or 6,000 Chinese, that's their choice. But I don't see how, uh, you know, how that's such a good idea, you know, and in Vietnam, you know, it's very ethnocentric here and uh, they don't they don't have to apologize. And, you know, you've been here, you know, you, you see how fairly uh, monolithic it is. Um, mm -hmm. And then that's nothing wrong with that. You know, you know, that, yeah, it's beautiful. That's, as, that's as, as it yeah. is. You know, different countries should be different. Amen. Amen, man. So speaking of love for your family and love for your people, I saw on your YouTube, you have a an adorable nephew and that that song's very good I, I was gonna mix that in right here actually with me is my nine month old nephew and uh, most days I take at least uh, a walk or two with him so that's a couple miles through the neighborhood and that's how I um, get a feel for life here it's, uh, it's an exercise, but more importantly, it's also uh, for this little guy because he enjoys the street life of Saigon as much as I do. Uh, his name is Suki, by the way, and that's only a nickname, which is typical for all Vietnamese uh, kids. Uh, I talk to him the way I would talk to an adult while we're out on our walks. Because I believe um, all these words will um, permeate his consciousness. So I talk to him constantly the way I would talk to any anyone that, that I was uh, that I was walking to, uh, walking with. Uh, every now and then, though, I would start to sing because uh, you know basically I would run out of things to say. And since I only know half of one song, I end up singing the same lyrics over and over. Okay, with that in mind, holy shit, with that in mind, I'll sing those lyrics for you. Uh, this song is special to me because it was written during the war, but it's uh, a celebration of Saigon. The title of it is, Saigon, You Are So Beautiful, So Beautiful. And uh, the sense of optimism and uh, enjoyment of life is really striking because it was uh, basic. well, obviously it was a very horrific time. 
but uh, there is an exuberance to the song that has made it so enduring for all the people here. So the song is still popular, although it was written, uh, I guess, nearly half a century ago. Okay, so here we go. Rừng chân trên bến khi chiều nắng chưa phai Nhìn xa thấp thoáng muôn tà áo tung bay Nếp sông vui tươi nối chân nhau đến nơi đây Sài Gòn đẹp lắm, Sài Gòn ơi, Sài Gòn ơi Rừng chân trên bến khi chiều nắng chưa phai That um, is, is, I think, at a certain level, globalism is a little bit inevitable because, for example, that song is uh, clearly it's influenced a little bit by the West, and a lot of the stuff I listen to, I, I, I like Japanese music, I like all over it, Russian, and we're especially with the internet, we're only going to influence each other more and more and more. But there's no reason to push it, and I think that's kind of the thing that that pisses people off and why there's this big um, backlash. That, like you said, they should stay monolithic, and it'll just—it's going to happen anyways. And that's true diversity is trying your best to kind of maintain at least a somewhat homogenous group, and and let them naturally, if they want to in, invite six thousand Kenyans or whatever. Okay, so be it. If they want to, um, you know, influence each other's music, um, you know, like one Japanese guy—he's a—he's a, he's a hip hop artist, and he influenced the world. And um, his his beats now now the West is kind of copying the East, the East is copying the West. I think it's. It's natural, and I think that's a good thing. I think if it's if it's genuine, if it's sincere, and it's picking the pros and not just forcing this, you know, patronizing crap. Um, so the other thing I wanted to bug you about is what are your thoughts on the horseshoe theory? Do you think it's BS, or do you think there's any truth to it? The the, the what theory? The the horseshoe theory that basically the further left you get, the more you oh. have in common with the far right, the extremes. For oh, me, I, 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 I never heard of that. Heard of that too. <laughs> anyway. yeah. Ah, well, yeah. so I, 
like basically so i was looking at again i'm creeping you online and i saw some of your old um poetry and i think it was it was back in 2008 or something like that it was at berkeley you were speaking doing um doing some poetry and the guys were talking they were introducing you and it was at a time of war and so you know you were the left's you know darling back in the day because um you know it, it followed what they what what fit their agenda at the time but because they weren't consistent with their ideology they threw you at the curb and it's kind of weird i think a lot of people who felt that they're on the left or or in the middle libertarian whatever things are just insane right now and like now the it's it's no joke actual nazis are the ones protesting the syrian war these are the ones that are singing protest songs and the left is saying no no we need to save these you know the chemical attacks it's things are crazy Hey Joe Sixpack Democrat, it seems you're in a bind. Your once beloved party's gone and lost its fucking mind. There's no room left for straight white men. You plain been left behind. You know I'm right. You know I'm right. You know I'm right. You voted for Obama not just once but twice indeed. You thought that all these immigrants were just like you and me. Share your vote with blacks and queers to combat corporate greed. You know I'm right, you know I'm right, you know I'm right. You know I'm right, you know I'm damn well right. These motherfuckers hate you just because your skin is white. You know I'm right, you yeah, know I'm damn well right. You know I'm never wrong, I'm on the right. Your country's getting dark. With every passing year The future of replacement Is met with whoops and cheers These non-whites won't be happy Till your head is on a spear You know I'm right, you know I'm right You know I'm right Well, hey, Joe Sixpack White Man Now what are you to do? To think who you can't criticize Or see who's ruling you he says he's white one moment, then proclaims that he's a Jew. You know I'm right, you know I'm right, you know I'm right. You know I'm right, you know I'm damn well right. Motherfuckers hate you just because your skin is white. You know I'm right, you know I'm damn well right. You know I'm never wrong, I'm on the right. Now it doesn't matter. If you like gay marriage or hate the Fed These smarmy Jewish motherfuckers want to see it dead Their surnames start with gold or green But underneath they're red You know I'm right, you know I'm right, you know I'm right So join your fellow white men now And understand this truth The enemy is ready and he'll fight you nail and two future of our country for our blood and soil and youth you know i'm right you know i'm right you know i'm right you know i'm right you know i'm damn well right these motherfuckers hate you just because your skin is white you know i'm right you know i'm damn well right you know i'm never wrong i'm on the right I ain't fighting in no war, man. Not against anti-globalist nations. Not in this era. It's the wrong generation. The elites are on a rampage. Manufacturing rage. They'll throw you in a steel cage. They don't give a toss for you. No Russian ever called me, no Russian ever called me, no Russian ever called me, why trash so fuck your war? And while they keep inciting, these wars they want us fighting, these songs will keep a writing, yeah, no more brother wars. No Russian ever called me, no Russian ever called me, no Russian ever called me, why trash so fuck your war? I'll tell you of this feller, David Rockefeller. He's down in Satan's cellar, burning in the flames galore. No Russian ever called me, no Russian ever called me, no Russian ever called me. Why trash, so fuck your war. <laughs> Never again, 
Not ever. Never. And now their new objections that they hacked our election. But dare I even mention that I hope they did indeed. No Russian ever called me. No Russian ever called me. No Russian ever called me. Why trash the fuck your war? Yeah, the sodomites are jeering, and the queers keep on a queering. All you devils get to steer and clear, and new dawn's on the rise. No Russian ever called me. No Russian ever called me. Me. No Russian ever called me Why trash the fuck your war? <laughs> Not now, man. Wrong time. Wrong time in history to be going that. Oh, Soros and his boss smile With Kissinger and Rothschild All banksters and pedophiles And they're gearing up for war. No Russian ever called me, no Russian ever called me, no Russian ever called me, why trash the fuck your war? Hey director James B. Comey, you're a filthy rotten phony, yeah you cloven hoof, son of Hoover, damn your lying eyes. No Russian ever called me, no Russian ever called me, no Russian ever called me, why trash the fuck your war? <laughs> The Fed's investigating, but it's all your time a-wasting. Might as well be masturbating, yeah, that's all they gotta show. No Russian ever called me, no Russian ever called me, no Russian ever called me, why trash the fuck you war? Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, here's the part, here's the part where we all gather around the big funeral pyre. Oh, glorious America, clutched warm in Zion's claws. Our courts corrupt, our country's gone. The Jews hacked off our balls. No sovereignty, no identity. God's left us in the dust And turned what's good to a ghetto hood And left us there to rust Tuh. gonna fight in World War Three. The boots may hit the ground, but you won't see me. No, I ain't killing Russians for the land of the unfree. But who's gonna fight in World War Three? Welcome to our nightmare, the devil has confirmed. Your vote had never counted, so skip your turn. When all is said and done, oh, it's all gonna burn. <laughs> Rome wasn't burned in just one day. You have no nation and you have no name They flood our homelands full of filth and say that you're to blame So why should I die and scratch my family name? Oh, just to be a loser in your game So who's gonna fight in World War Three? The boots may hit the ground, but you won't see me No, I ain't killing Russians for the land of the unfree But who's gonna fight in World War Three? You who lead the circus, well, we ain't your pets And we ain't fight your endless wars while we drown in debt We'll never be the same, but there's been no changes yet Except the blood of our soil Dear Donnie, are you listening? You lost our respect You're just another shill for an oligarchal wreck And when the body bags start coming home, don't you forget Yeah, <laughs> well, this ain't our bloody mess so who's gonna fight in World War Three? The boots may hit the ground, but you won't see me. No, I ain't killing Russians for the land of the unfree, but who's gonna fight in World War Three? Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die. Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die. Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die. Our blood is on their hands. A
abandon all hope to you who enter here You're hanging by a thread on the sleeves of puppeteers And as the empire falls, don't shed a single tear <laughs> Just come on over and give it a little shove So who's gonna fight in World War Three? The boots may hit the ground, but you won't see me No, I ain't killing nobody for the land of the unfree But who's gonna fight in World War Three? Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die Our blood is on their hands Fair Columbia, lay you down to sleep And pray to Israel your battered soul to keep You may have died <laughs> And you won't wake Oh, what difference Does it even make Still I ain't fighting In World War Three. The boots may hit the ground No, you won't see me No, I ain't killing Russians For the land of the unfree So, who's gonna fight In World War Three? gonna fight in World War Three? Not me. Who's gonna fight in World War Three?